Welcome to the Bronx Aerosol Arts Documentary Project. Today is Tuesday, July 12, 2023. I'm Pastor Crespo Jr., Research Librarian and Archivist here at the Bronx County Historical Society. I'm joined by Butch Too, a pioneering Bronx writer. Butch, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, everybody. I'm Butch Too, Cools Incorporated. Glad to be here. Great. Today we're going to interview Mays a pioneering Bronx writer in his own right, DJ, MC, and B-Boy. Welcome, Mays. Uh, introduce yourself. Thank you for having me. My name is Jerry Mays. Uh, I'm a legendary pioneer of uh, hip-hop. That's, that's all I know. That's, that's my life. Yeah. Uh, as, um, young kid. DJing, grabbing a mic, then two or three years later, we learn how to get a name, graph, and from there on, I wrote with the crew, and we started hitting the trains, and from there on, it went on. All right, that's great. You know, we like to start all our oral histories out by asking you to tell us a little about your family background, history, where your parents come from. Okay, so my pops is from Puerto Rico, um, so I'm from Puerto Rico. Um, my mother's from North Carolina, Raleigh. So, you know, I get to live both lifestyles, you know. So I'm proud of myself, you know, I like where I'm at. and It's just a blessing that I, I live two different cultures and I get to enjoy both. Do you remember when your father moved here to the U.S. from Puerto Rico? Uh, uh, could say maybe in seventies or sixties, the sixties, I believe. I would say, I would say maybe around the sixties. I'm not sure about that, but yeah, yeah. And he met your mother here in New York. I, I believe they met in. Um, New Jersey. Yeah, my mother was going to college and my father was a cook. And I guess, you know, my father, you know, trying to serve her some food, I guess he liked what he saw. <laughs> and um, uh, he gave me a story saying it was a little racist back then, so it was kind of hard for him to really like uh, talk with her and stuff like that because she was more color skin and my father was. I'm more on the white side, even though he was Puerto Rican, right. so he couldn't cross that line. So that's what went on back then. And so my father said he used to have to climb through the windows to say, hey, hi, you know, my moms and stuff like that, and try to, you know, see her or whatever. So yeah, that's how it was. All right, all right. Uh, when and where were you born? I was born in the Bronx, the South Bronx, on Home Street. Okay. 173rd, I'm sorry, 172nd in Home Street by Freeman. Um, born and raised in 172nd in the same neighborhood, maybe two blocks down. Uh, we moved down the block. Uh, stood there for like a good 12 years. Uh, Longfellow, 172nd. I went to uh, the school that was over there, uh, PS66. Got it. You know, it was, the Bronx was, it was a playground. That's what it was. It was, it was a uh, home of the rubble <laughs> Bronx. I mean, right. abandoned buildings, you know, and all that stuff. But that was normal to us. Right. I didn't know, I didn't know a difference from what, it, I mean, to me, it was just normal, you know, living the lifestyle we live. How many brothers and sisters did you have? I got one brother and I got five sisters on my father's side. Wow. wow. Yeah. All in the Bronx? Yeah, we were all in the Bronx. Yeah. 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 Do you remember the type of music you grew up listening to that your parents played in the house? Oh, yeah. Every Christmas there was um, Christmas parties, Thanksgiving parties and all that stuff. And it was mostly salsa and 
uh, Fanny All Stars. You know, it was the Spanish side of my family. You know, the grandma, the, the cafe, the coffee, the the Fanny All Stars, the the family gathering, the arguments, and you know, the, the fights and the jealousy, and you know, a lot of that going on at parties. Right. You know, at Christmas Christmas parties, everybody get their drink on and. and the Christmas tree was all over the place. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that's how, yeah, that's how it was. But that was, I don't know, it was just normal stuff, I guess. <laughs> now, I, you, you, you told us where you were born. Now, growing up, where did you, what was your neighborhood in the Bronx? Uh, okay, so mainly on Longwood Avenue. Longwood Avenue. Yeah, um, Southern Boulevard and Longwood and Fox. That's that's where I'm, I've been there forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As a young kid coming out of teenage, you're walking out your front door. What are you hearing and seeing on Longwood Avenue? Talk to us about that activity back then. Uh, a lot of negativity. Uh, what do you mean by that? A lot of gangsters, a lot of drugs. Um, uh, a lot of fights, arguments, you know, the garbage all over the street. Um, uh, not, but some of it was okay, you know, the sports and the basketball, the baseball, you know. Got it. And, and that's kind of good because that leads off to the very next question, mm -hmm. you know, as a kid. Right. What are those neighborhood games that you played growing up? Um, Stickball, basketball, with the crate that you have to make yourself, mm -hmm. and the backboard you have to make yourself on a pole or something. And you would, you know, you would invent. We would invent games. We were, we were kids. And we didn't need no money. We knew how to invent stuff. We made our own go karts. Take the wheels off of the shopping carts. Take the wheels off of the big wheels. Get a two by four, right. get a crate, color it if you wanted to, red, black, and green, or whatever colors. Put a break on it, <laughs> piece of wood. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I'm talking about wood. You put a number on it, you know, and we would race down the hill, you know. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really exciting. But, yeah, we would do everything with no money. Just found a way to try to enjoy life, you know, and have fun. And we were creative. Kick the can, you yeah. know. Kick the can. We grab can. Last one to grab a can is it. And there was cans all over the street. Like I said, garbage was everywhere. Uh -huh. So, you know, Skelzies, every all types of games. We had like tag with Olivia Skelzies, hot piece of butter, uh, all types of. You know, if it wasn't that, we was doing clubhouses, you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, get the furniture from off the street, get an empty apartment, paint the walls up, put the peace sign up. You know, just go hang out and then that night there was no lights, get candles, and that was our hangout. You know, daytime we would do the mattress thing and just start flipping all over the mattress. and It was just... Those were like times just, you know, people wouldn't know unless they lived that. So. Right. You said empty apartment. Were there that many empty apartments? Well, there was buildings that were empty. <laughs> Maybe wow. like two or three people that lived in the buildings. Wow. So, yeah, and I was one of the last in my neighborhood to leave my building. Wow. And it's crazy because I was one of the first to live in a renovated building by Father Gigante. And I was one of the last to leave my building in 172nd in Longfellow. And I was one of the first to live in the first renovated building in the South Bronx by Father Gigante. What year was that? 75. 75. And you mentioned earlier, you know, you going to public school. Middle school. What middle school did you go to? What year did that start? Middle school, start. middle school, 76, bicentennial year. 
I went to IS-52, where a lot of artists also are from that same school. A lot of uh, Sancetos, a lot of you know, Ray Barreto, and I, mean, I don't know who else, but yeah, a lot of big time artists came out of IS-52. Um, so yeah, I went to that school. Yeah, I, I, I stood there to the eighth grade and did a talent show. I was like, one, I could say maybe I was one of the first to do a talent show that was involved in hip hop. Nineteen eighty one, I would say. I did a rap show at my school. Talk to us about that rap show. Uh, so. Uh, the guy who was playing the music, we were in the same music class. He, um, the, the famous record then was called Heartbeat. So he was like, yeah. so my teacher said, let's do a talent show. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could skate. I said, roller skate. Okay, I'll do a skating show, but I want to do a rap show. That's more interesting than the skating show as well. Right. So I did a skating show first, and then I did the rap show. And the drummer played Heartbeat. While wow. me and another person, another person got on the mic, so they were playing the heartbeat with the drums, and I was just going with, along with the the beat, and I had the whole auditorium clapping their hands. Everybody stood up. The teachers was clapping their hands. Students was clapping their hands, and it was like it, it was just a uh, it was amazing. It was it was amazing. It was like I'm 13, 14 years old. And I have control of my school in the auditorium, and everybody's clapping their hands and having fun. And you know, it was, it was a time of my life. I, I was like, great. And I wish I could get that video. If I get that video, then that has a lot of proof of facts. Wow. That at that time wasn't even. We were still early in hip hop. We was uh, about three, four years, like really known, like coming up. Mm -hmm. Not. It, so it was still local. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't no other cities. We were still having it in the Bronx and maybe Manhattan, you know, New York City, but not not that far. But um, it was the early beginning of hip hop, yeah. Yeah. What high school did you go to? Alfred E. Smith. Okay. Yeah. Tell me about your earliest memories of going to Alfred E. Smith. Oh, well, so yeah, so I get to the school, and um, this vocational school, actually, I wanted to go to um, art and design mm -hmm. or fashion, but uh, at the time, for some reason, I couldn't get in or something like that, so Alfred, Alfred e. Smith took me in, so I went there for architect and um, carpentry. So I got a little bit of everything, plumbing, carpentry. Uh, so I, you know, I was pretty good there, you know, until I met some guys that was really interesting and they, they wanted to follow me and I became a leader. All right. And it was like I had my own school in the lunchroom. So everybody would talk to me about Hip hop, and I would give them the news because they didn't know there wasn't there wasn't I was in the streets, mm -hmm. and I was in the clubs, and I was with what what was happening, you know, in hip hop. I was in the mix, so because they were more like just you know not involved the way I was because I'm from the South Bronx, they were more from other areas, mm -hmm. so I had to let them know what was going on. I would tell them, okay, well, this is news. What happened? Yeah, I was in Roxy's. There was a battle between Rocksteady and the Floor Masters, or uh, this graffiti artist was there, and Zephyr, and, you know, it was like I had to explain to them what was going on in my world, mm -hmm. and they were interested. So, because I was involved with everything, every aspect of hip hop, I would just talk to them. They would bring their black books, bring markers, and everybody would be like, yo, do me a tag, or, or yo, you know, 
show me or teach me or yo you to bring your black book let's share black books and if it wasn't that I had them downstairs in the basement and I would teach them break it okay and how to break dance and stuff like that and we would use our lunchroom to dance so everybody people would get up start doing electric boogie and one would start breaking and so we were like just hang out in the lunchroom four fifth and sixth period and you know i go to class later <laughs> so that was you know that was really interesting in my high school years um because of that i got scouted uh, by some talent scouts that were uh making a movie called Beast Street. Came to my school looking for dancers. And um, they asked anybody, do you know anybody that dances over here? Who's a break dancer? Or, you know. So everybody, I came downstairs, everybody came to get me. And they're like, let me see what you can do. Okay, what's your name? Oh, you good? Oh yeah, let me get your name. Oh, okay, fine. Uh, the whole school came down. The principal said, no, nah, listen, we have to do this because everybody got to go to school. So one thing led to another. And uh, a friend of mine went and told somebody at a project at my haven. And uh, he came to my school. And when they saw him the next day, we had the audition again the next day. Mm -hmm. They they love they love they got have more love for him than they did me so they took him over me and I had taught him to uh, compete against crazy legs at a first class I think it was called at the time 138 and Walton 137 and Walton but I knew the guy and I was like you don't go to school what are you doing here and um. He was like, they told me about an audition. I said, like, yeah, but this is not related to you. You, you just came in and, and snuck in my school and got the part. And they told me, okay, we'll call you. They called me two or three weeks later, which they were filming all in my neighborhood. I didn't know it was the movie that they were doing. But I saw the trucks, the movie trucks and everything in my neighborhood for two weeks. So a lady called my mother. My mother said, oh, they want you to be here at Roxy's at this time. They're filming a the movie. I said, okay, fine, I'll be there. So I got my B-boy clothes, do all my Converse or my, my, uh, <laughs> my breakdancing suit. And I got there, and when I got there, they were filming a movie. So they were like, okay, fine, this is what we want you to do. Y'all got to be here, here, and there. They places and places. And, you know, I was like, this is not, this is not what you, I thought it was, I was going to be, you know, extra. So I said, oh, well, it's not up to me. It's up to Harry Belafonte. He's the producer or whatever. So, you know, I kind of like, I wasn't I wasn't too happy about the situation, but I was happy to be in the movie, whatever. So, uh, you know, it was just a point in time of my life that I could say, okay, fine, I was in the movie. Everybody, yeah, you in the movie. Yeah, and then come to find out, they didn't see much of me. But everybody thought that I was going to be in a movie because they spread it out. I didn't say it. I, didn't, I said, oh, I might mm -hmm. be in some movie. But they were like, oh. So everybody looking for me. And they, didn't, they maybe saw two or three seconds of me. So that was, you know, that was really interesting. Uh, and also I did something with this guy uh, that also he picked me up for a movie called The Pope of Greenwich Village with Mickey Rock. So we got extra parts in there. So that was, that was. And this cool. was all high school. Yeah, this is all high school. Yeah, yeah, all high school. Yeah, yeah this was in the hardcore mid explosion of hip hop. Yeah. It would be like 82, 83 when everything was, yeah. was busting open. You know, the 70s was, yeah, but. 81, 82, 83, 80, you know, that was when it started to either fall or rise. So it started to rise at, at that point. You mentioned earlier uh, the Roxies. 
and go on to battle with Rocksteady. Uh, for people who don't know, what's the Rocksteady? Rocksteady was a crew based out of Manhattan in the Bronx. Uh, and Prospect the Avenue, 183rd, and Manhattan was 96. So they had two divisions, and they were known to be the Rocksteady crew. And you were talking about the venue, the Roxy's. Yeah. In Manhattan. Yeah. For those who don't know, what's the Roxy? Um, the Roxy's was a place a home of hip hop where we came and we invaded a place called the Roxy's. Hip hop oh, hip hop invaded the Roxy's which we were we was not wanted. They don't they didn't really want us there. They accepted us because they were making money. But the fact that we were taken over and the Latinos and the blacks and the hip hop and the Bambara and the Jazzy J and the Red Alert and the Africa Islam. Friday nights, Saturday nights. So half of it would be like more on the white side, the other half would be Spanish and blacks and the culture of hip hop. So whenever they saw us, they would move to the side like they didn't want to be around us. But uh, that was that was what we put up with. At this point, we're going to move on over to Graf. Okay. And nobody better to ask you questions about Graf than a true pioneer, Butch, too. Yes. What's up? Yeah, but in, in closing with what you had said, uh, the Roxy, I think that uh, it's it was a fusion. It became a fusion because we didn't run them out. Right. They just changed up. That's now correct. they start, they got a little punky. Yes. They learned how to dance. That's the truth. They facts. started re going in. Yes, that's the truth. Yeah, they wanted yeah. to get involved. They didn't they had no choice but to get involved right. because, You're coming in. because yeah. we were invading. So mm -hmm. they were like either you accept us or you leave. Right. So the only way they was gonna accept us is like, okay, well we clash with Can't them. Can't beat them, join them. <laughs> and if and if you see how Blondie got with Fat Five Freddy. You know, that's that's how it came together. They're like, okay, well, we can't beat them because, you know, it's it's already a culture. This culture is already big. Right. So let's join them and let's make money off of them. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's true facts. You know what I'm talking about, Butch. Yeah. All right. They say that, well, I've heard that Graph is the first element. Do you remember when you first saw Graph? Or when it caught your attention, because Graf has always kind of been. Yeah. When, when I, did it catch your, your attention? I I was actually on the six train. I was on Whitlock. That's where I used to live. Okay. Yeah. It's our area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's our area. Right. Yeah. Longfellow. So, yes. <laughs> yes. And we got to talk about that. Right. But um, I got on the train because I was living on Longwood at the time, but I was always coming back to my old neighborhood, mm -hmm. 172nd and Longfellow. Right. So I either took the train or the 31 bus, if you remember the 31 bus. So I took, I got on the train to come home on Woodlock, and um, I saw this guy grab a marker and just freestyle motion tagging on the train. And I was like, oh man, what's that? And this dude was an older guy. I was like, whoa, this guy just right in front of, I'm the only one on the train. He's like, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> Oh wow, that looks crazy. That looked like fun. So I was like, wow, you know. I was like, okay, cool. And then um, there was another time when I was in the schoolyard at 66, and uh, a few of us, a few of us got together. Uh, we learned how to open the door to the school. <laughs> we grabbed the paint from the art department, and we went to the walls and started uh, painting like brushes and stuff like that till I seen uh, a brother of mine do a, a A1. Uh, no, was it an A1? A L1. L1. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, wow. Like bubble letters, like, you know, letters, but color style. Right. And I'm talking about like, poof, 74, 73, 74. Early. So I was like, yeah, so that was like a vision of my first time. Yeah, that was like a vision of my first, besides, you know, my cousin's drawing and stuff on paper, and, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that, which they, they would be a great artist too. 
But um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you: uh, Did your graph name affect your b boy name, or did your b boy name affect your graph name? Actually, my graph name affected my MC name. Okay, because I was an MC before I was a graph writer. Good question. I, I used to go by the name of MC Wiz Kid. So that's what you started writing? Well, I tried to write Wiz Kid, but I was like, that's an MC name. That's not really a, a tag up name. So I was like, mm. I tried LJ, E L J A Y, and I tried Track 2. Uh, and then I had another name, but I can't remember. Uh, yeah, but um, then I was like, I need a name because I notice all these names have four letters. A lot of good names have four letters, three letters, or something like that. I was like, I need a name. I need a name. So I went into a store and I bought a puzzle book at a candy store. Mm -hmm. And I saw the word name, name Maze. And I was like, Maze. I was like, oh, Maze. I was like, that's going to be my name. Four letters, everything. I was okay. like, those are easy letters, M A Z E. I was like, so that stuck stuck with me, and that's you know, I became the name Maze, and I gave up the name Wiz Kid on a microphone, and I'm talking about like 78, 79. Mm. So I became Maze, but still I was Wiz Kid, but I was you know both at one time. I had like. I was so many different people. I, I had a, people didn't know me. They knew me as Jerry D, some as a DJ. Another one knew me as Wiz Kid. Another knew me as Maze. So I was, everybody was confused. Like, who is this guy? Like, they didn't. And then my fashion, people following me because I was a fashion leader, and I had the graffiti jacket, and I had the gazelles, and I had the British walkers, I had the Lees, I had the sheepskin, I had the sheepskin, everything. I was down by law, like, you know, I had the chain, the gold chain, the Everything. rope, you know, that came a little, you know, and it was like, and my mother's like, you walk down the street, I said, walk, I walk it down, like, people know me, so, you know, but, you know, it was, it was dangerous, but, you know, and thank, thank God I never got robbed, you know, so I was, I was a skater, I was, I was number two class skater in the Roller skater? Yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I was the skate master, then there was me. And I learned by skate master. And then we learned from the professionals, the good skates, which is Bill Butler and his crew from the Empire, Central Park, you know, uh, Laces, all these guys that were number one, that were, became a group, and they, they would tour and make money. So I was in that field of my skating. Career tool, so. so I was I was a mix of everything. Oh wow! Yeah, so yeah, so I think the name Maze just fit me, like it's a puzzle. Like, let me let me ask you. So when did you tell me? When did you first declare yourself a writer? When did you put your hands on a marker, keep it with you? You know, got in your mind what you was where you were going to bomb. Tell me about that. Uh, I, um, I met some kids on my neighborhood. And they were writers, and they were more up on writers than I were because they went to art and design. And these kids are very popular today, but I'm not going to mention no names because they don't Music want to. Music and art, art and design, all them fashionists too. Yeah. I, I know that crowd. So we got together and we started motion tagging, you know, going on the six or the way to Pelham, you know, and I was like, oh, you got a nice color, green. Ooh. Oh, where you get that color from? Purple. Ooh. You know, so it was like not only it was it was just the colors was and then you would put two different colors in one marker mm -hmm. and then they would write two different mm -hmm. two different colors and, and you get the floods and you get the ink all over mm -hmm. your hand mm -hmm. and it was just excitement and it was it was it was like a, a rush. Mm -hmm. It was like a rush and it was like, okay, fine, we'll take a tag. Go ahead, take tags, hurry up. All right, the train's going to stop. Stop. All right, I'll look out. You take a tag. You know what I mean? So it was it was excitement. It was criminalizing excitement. It was mm -hmm. criminalizing ex excitement and 
you know, just having fun with it, you know. And then when I first went to the, my friend took me to the twos and the fives up there by Gun Hill to the Esplanade. And I was like, oh, wow, I'm actually on the train. And it's parked. And we can get in. We have the key and we get in. And, and I was like, oh, wow. I said, this is kind of fun but dangerous. So, you know, it's, it was all just, you know, a bunch of dangerous fun. You know. Yeah, exciting. So where, where was your first tag? My first tag, where well, was my first? I'd say it was in school. I in public school, yeah. on 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 the staircases or on the desk, in the bathroom, you know, sneaking around here and there, you know. But uh, like I said, then I learned to get on the train and we would walk, get on the train, and while the train is moving, there's nobody on the train. We get it because I didn't know about how to get on the train. I was still too young. Mm -hmm. And I was like, how do these people get on the train and they get, they can do a piece or they can do colors and they can do all that. And I didn't know how to get there yet. I, all I knew was just getting on the train and trying to add my name to where they already had their tags. So I would motion, call motion tagging. Mm -hmm. So that's what, that's what, till I got caught with Hickey and Skeeter. <laughs> they, I remember them. <laughs> they, they took my marker and they wanted to write on me and all the other stuff. Yeah, yeah. Did you did you go to the writers bench? You ever been there before? Oh, of course, I went to the writers bench many a times. Yeah, the writers bench was right after school, two thirty, one p.m. Uh, right from my school, right to um. Smith is on the next. Yeah, side. yeah, yeah, yeah. I could have walked over there to the bench, right. but yeah, we would take the train and. From Third Avenue to 149 in Grand Concourse, and we would just chill there, and we'll meet up there and see who's there, and see who's looking at trains, and be like, "Oh, he's a writer. Right. Oh, he's a writer. Oh, they write. Oh, there's a group. Oh, they on that side. Oh, who's us? Like, so you know, everybody had their own, and you can nobody really knew who was who unless you knew each other from the school, or right. the area, or the trains, or something, but. A lot of people, they kind of knew, but they would tell, yo, that's that guy over there. Yo, you know who that is over there? Da, da, da. So it was it was just like secret, secret society. Like, yo, nobody got to know who you are. Yeah, until they find out, then it's a wow. Oh, my God, you? Yo, man, I see you everywhere. Like, oh, man, you know. It's always, that's how it is. It's like surprise, you know. It's like we're meeting a king, you know? Yeah. All right, which, so what lines did you hit? What stations did you go for the layups when you finally found the layups? Uh, I, like I said, I started going to, Gun I would go Hill. to Gun Hill. And, but I, that wasn't really my line because I think the twos and the fives were too crowded. It was too many people on the line. It was too bombed. So I would go to, uh, mainly I would go to St. Lawrence. Uh, Zariga, St. Lawrence, the tunnels, the, the layups. When it's cold, they go on the ground. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, um, you know, it was, like I said, it was dangerous. You have to watch out for police. And you got to know when to and when not to and the time they lay them up and the time the, the cleanup guy gets out or the, the cleanup guy is there, he might chase you out. Or, you know, he, you know, it was... It was uh, it was exciting. Did you ever did you ever get involved in any chase scenes? Did you ever? Oh man, yeah, I could tell you about a good one. So yeah, I'm with my crew at the point at that time. Um, I was with TAT, my crew. Uh, we had got chased by I guess a few cops, and uh, we happened to try to come down the pole and I never did the pole it was my first time and I'm looking at my boy Brim and he climbed the pole down I said oh I never know how to do this he said no, just follow me so it's like seven of us and we trying to come down the pole so the one is on top is like yo hurry up let's go 
So while we coming down the pole, the police in the bottom of the cars are rolling by us. Oh. And we're like, oh, the cops are stay up here. And then the cop on the track is coming to get the whoever's on top. So my friend said, yo, I got to jump. So my friend wound up jumping behind us while we were still on the pole coming down. And he came down, he fell, and that was it. And he was like, yo, I'm hurt. I can't. So now when we're trying to pick him up, the cops are rolling by. And they're like, ooh, they're trying to go to the station thinking it's a station, but they didn't see us coming on the pole. So we have to grab my friend, something like some, you know, uh, army type of movie type of thing. So we grab our friend and we helped him. His leg was done. He, yeah, but um, yeah, that was a crazy time. Wow. Yeah, that was like maybe like eighty two ish, eighty eighty something like that, eighty two ish. Yeah. You got any uh, racking experiences? Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, you know, these are things you learn from being down with a crew. And these are experiences that you go through if you want to be part of the team. So, uh, racking spots will be uh, Macquarie's on Third Avenue, uh, TSS, Alexander's, um, Woolworth, you know, and just go in there and grab a book bag or stash it behind you back they have like 10 or 20 cans make sure nobody's around you just stash them and you walk out like you ain't got nothing so you ain't got nothing in your hands so they see you ain't got nothing in your hands so it's like he's all right he ain't got nothing but basically you you know racked up like 20 cans and they don't know that so yeah but you know racked up with a a few partners <laughs> also got caught once, but <laughs> yeah. But, um, Did you ever hit any other boroughs, Queens, Brooklyn stores, Long Island? Uh, not really, nah. Those were for more like people who was really deep into racking or they had a car they could get around yeah. or, you know, they, they knew spots, you know. I would just stay local where, you know, mm -hmm. I was close to home. All right. So, yeah, that's how it was. Okay. Uh, are you known for any specific lettering style? You got any, any styles that you call yours, you know, maybe you like bubble letters and marshmallow letters, round style? Um, I like style letters. I'm more into arrows and... I would say the mid '80s, or the the late '70s, and the mid '80s, more like the case and everything with arrows, you know, scene, case, you know. I I follow, I guess, I would say, kind of like in between my crew and some that I really I admired, so. But I like style letters, and I just like to invent, you know, and I think it just became, like, my style. So I try to put my name in a puzzle. So. That's what I like. My name has to, from one letter, has to go into another one, nice. go into the third one, and go into the fourth one. And there's a, there's an entrance, and there's an exit, if I really get technical. Like then, a maze. Right. So you have to find your way from number one all the way to number 10, if I was to number it, or maybe whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's like it takes you in. You know, and sometimes I will have two letters in each letter, two A's, two M's, two A's, two Z's, and two E's. And how I figured it out, I figured it out myself. I was like, wait a minute double letters here and as there's a part of it's just something that it's it comes to me you know and i'm like okay cool that's that's hot i like that so i think 
that's part of my style that I, you know, I kind of like really like. I like to also put my mind into it like a puzzle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that it'd be amazing. <laughs> right. So it's, that's just, uh, you know. All right. So what about like if you're going to do a piece on a wall or a layup or something? You have to put it down on paper first. Do you plan the colors, the 3D, or do you just flow? Do you get help from your crew? Um, How does that work? It could go both ways. I could do something on paper and then try to put it on a wall, or I could freestyle. You know, sometimes freestyling is good too because you just write that off the top of your head. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an artist thing. You know, or in, in every aspect, is there's an artist in you that you have to. Let out, you know. It doesn't matter. Like it's like dancing steps. Right. It's like dancing letters. It's like freestyle, like rhyming, freestyle, and off the top of the head. So it's just doing it as it comes to you. That's that's yeah. And the colors is just just flow with it. Just, What's you know. your favorite colors? What's your favorite brand? Oh. Uh. I'm old school, so I would say Krylon. <laughs> yeah, that's old school. <laughs> I would say Krylon. Krylon is Krylon had had the colors. Yeah. You know the greens, the mint greens, the purples, the light purples, the the aquas, the the yellows, the school bus yellows. Yeah. Oh man, it's, it was so different, you know, and those colors pop out. They make you shine. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, those are my favorite colors though. Yeah, the light blues. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, you know. Yeah. Violets, purple. Yes, yes. All right. right. What about your spray cap game? Because Krylon, Red Devil and all that, you didn't need to have a spray cap game. You get your, you know, standard shit. But nowadays, what about all this high pressure, low pressure Montana shit? Do you know anything about that? Um, uh, uh, I don't. I'm not, I'm not too. I'm not too technical with that. I always like the regular cap and you know the fat cap and you know the spray starch. And, right. Yeah. The the way they have it now, they have caps for skinny cap. They have caps medium cap. We didn't have that back in the days. We had just two or three caps, and that was it. Mm -hmm. Now they got all types of caps. So. It's different paint, different, different caps, different paint, different colors, uh, different quality, you yeah. know. So it's a different feeling, but we have to go with it because that's the new thing now. So, yeah. you know, it's not like I'm used to the Krylon and I'm used to the smell and I'm used to the colors where I can, you know, but everything changes in time. That's true. Evolution. Yeah. Man. yeah so. But you could go online and order banana caps and all this. How did you get your caps back in the days? Uh, if I wasn't getting them from the stores, <laughs> the spray starch. <laughs> nah. Uh, I would get. I, I would get it. Uh, other cans or partners. You know. Yo, let me. You know, borrow something. Or right. Whatever. But, um, yeah, you know, you have to be an inventor also, you know, about yeah. caps too. Yeah. You know, how to go in there and clean it out and put the needle through the cap and make sure that it, it sprays and stuff like that so it, it clogs up or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you have any mentors? Anybody that you admired back in the days growing up or? You know, gave you pointers, tips, lessons. Uh, uh, scene was a big. Which one? Scene UA. Uh, scene also scene TC five also. Both of them. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, when it came to like pieces, there was like, you know, Lee. You know. Oh, man. 
Mitch, the, you know, like certain writers that were that I used to like. Scene was one of them. Both of them scenes. White boy scene. That was the one that on the six yes, line yes, of town. Yes, because I, I, yeah, I would always see UA pieces, and I would always look out for them. You know, the PJ and the scene, right. and, and they were like, uh, they were like really, they were close to us. So, you know, like I uh, got to meet a couple of the members, and at that time, to meet UA was a big thing. United you know, artists, right? So I was, you know, as as far as like, you know, the the upcoming writers. But I used to I used to always see a super cool two twenty three, yeah. which I was like, oh my god, the staff, you know, and it was just like whoever had the hairstyle, you know, Zephyr, you know, um, that was important. CIA, um, TLP, LK with the drips. Um, It was so so many different crews. So many, you know, you had the one line, IBM, and you know, everybody had the it was it was everybody had their their side on the on the on the tracks, like on the line. Like everybody whoever was on Broadway, who was on the twos and fives, who was on the six line. So it was just like it was just a moving uh museum. Looking at everybody and see how they did their their art compared to what I was looking at on the six line, right. you know, ghost with the, you know the people that bombed and all that the insides. Uh, it was so many. It was so many. It was so many. Too many. Did you did you inspire any of your b boys to come to the yard or anything like that? Yo, um, come on, y'all, let's go in. Um, I think. I had a partner or two, and we would go, and I would be like, yo, come down, let's go. I can't, my mom's, you know, oh, my mom's won't let me. I was like, bro, it's like 7 or 8, 7 o'clock in the morning. Right. Like, you can't come out at 7 in the morning? Oh, my mom's won't let me, you know. I, but, um, yeah, we had to sneak out with our bags, and my mother say, I, I know where you're going. Uh, what are you going to do? Try to keep it low, my mother. She didn't. She didn't. It wasn't the thing where my mother let me do it. Never. never I just. My mother was. She would have found out what I was doing. That would have been me. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I didn't. My mother wasn't that type to say, "Yeah, go ahead, go right now." Like, that. that wasn't happening. That wasn't happening. I would have been really in a lot of trouble. My mom found out I was in the tracks, running in the tracks, and and running from trains and running to the train. You know, so uh, she, yo, you. you you know, I wouldn't let her come. I wouldn't let her see me. I come in the house all dirty. Yeah. <laughs> all my clothes are dirty. Paint is on your hands for like three days. Your, yeah. You know, paint might be on your face or your hair yeah. or whatever. So, yeah. All right. Let me. I got one more question for you. Tell me about the piece, the one piece that you like most proud of. Could be a whole car. Could be a throw up. It might be certain colors. Tell me about that one piece. All right. Yeah. I, I I wasn't okay, so I had on the white cars I did a piece also, a light blue one which is that one I, I got a picture of, so that's good. But um that yeah, but I I really liked the, my throw up. I think I I did a lot of damage on my throw ups because I was mostly an inside guy. I didn't. I wasn't really too cool with doing outsides, and then until I got my throw up together, right? And I was like, okay, I'm gonna start doing throw ups. So, so you quick with it. So I yeah. So I just you know I was just like yellow, black, or orange and black, right. you know. And I was like, okay, fine. And I got to actually see my throw ups ro- run on the train because you know they used to buff them. You know the white trains that yeah. were buffing them real quick. Quick. So yeah, but um. I didn't get to do the gray and blue ones. Maybe I did. I don't. I don't. I, not hardcore, but I got to take a couple of tags on the outsides and something like that. But I was mainly inside. But then when the white trains came in, I was like, "Oh man!" I was like, "Oh, that looked nice." Yeah, like, yes, <laughs> and yeah, like, "Oh yeah, they did the right thing for us." So yeah, I would just if, if I had to go by myself, I go by myself. I get my cans and be like, 
go through four, five, six trains or whatever, and then make sure I get out of there safe. And and then the next day, I'll be like, yeah, waiting for it to roll. I'll be like, yeah, let me go to Whitlock or let me go to Elder or, you know, somewhere where I could check it out, you know. So, yeah, but uh, I mean, it's, it was always a good thing to see your name actually running, you know. And, and, and if you're right under your tag, and you're on the train, that is the best feeling. <laughs> like for a writer, like I just bombed this yesterday. Right. And I'm over here just sitting and nobody know who that is, but they looking at it. And I'm like, wow, that's a good feeling. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> I done did some MTA destruction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna pass it back to the pastor. Cool. All right. Hey, could you talk to us about uh, any writing crews that you were with and Especially TAT, how did that begin? Uh, I was actually on Longwood Avenue. I saw a little guy come out of the tunnel, look kind of like dirty-ish. And I'm there on the platform, I'm like, yo, shorty, where you write, shorty? He said, well, I don't write, where you write? I said, I said, uh, I, said I write maze, I give, I give myself. He gave me another name. He said, oh, yeah, I write that. And he said, yeah, I write Brill. And I was like, okay, you write Brill? Oh, boy, bro. He's like, yo, I see you up. Okay, cool. Like, he says, uh, I says, you want to write TAT? I said, all right, yeah, that's cool. I'm down. He said, all right, cool. Let's put up TAT. I said, all right, cool. So, that was that from there. From there on, I got to meet uh, one or two, three other fellas, which is there's only three members at the time. And um, I, I was there like in the early stage, maybe like like four or five guys. It wasn't it wasn't a whole team. So I was who were like, those early guys? Who were the early guys? Uh, Mac. The, uh, Delta Two, I believe, was also. Grim was a prez. Uh, Vile. Um, that's as far as I can remember. Yeah, or maybe uh, who else was uh, there? I think. Um, what's his name? But uh, can't get his name. Joey TDS. But I think I'm not sure he wrote TAT, but Joey. Yeah, he was also bombed with. Uh, Delta, Mac, and Brim, they went on a bombing mission, yeah, but yeah, and my also, yeah, at that time, and I came, like, right after that, yeah. Graffiti Hall of Fame, talk to us about that. Oh, and, uh, I remember when Volcan had that, Volcan was, uh, the headliner. Well, remember that? Not, but I know Vulcan, but I don't remember that part. And like he had a, he had the big, the big robot, the Vulcan piece mm -hmm. up there. Mm -hmm. Like he would get it like, well, like for years he had like he had like a couple of, like the front, the front page yeah. of the Hall of Fame, and uh, yeah, but that was more like Harlem stuff, but um. Uh, yeah, the Hall of Fame was just a great place to be there, meet artists, um, great artists, you know. And um, as time went by, it just you know it's changed. You know, we had like the the new incoming artists from around the world and stuff like that. Back then, it was just mainly local writers from you know Harlem, Bronx, whatever. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful thing, you know, to bring the artist to one location where we could call like the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's great. A lot of, I met a lot of great guys under there and a lot of pioneers. So, you know, yeah, people I thought I'd never meet, you know. So, 
Well, have you have you painted the Hall of Fame? Um, I have. Yes, I did. Actually, I did something with the crew. We did. Um, uh, I don't know what year was that. Could have been like late '80s, early '90s. Yeah, I did a maze piece there. Yeah, with the crew. Yeah, I was. That was. Uh, I was so happy that you know. We had got the paint right there at the front with everybody. That was yeah, cool. yeah. That front wall became Tat Screw's job every year. Yes, 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 yes. Which is beautiful. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I guess, you know, everybody likes their work, so, you know, mm -hmm. that's great that they, um, every year, come up and do it as much as, you know, do what they can, you know. So, yeah. Before I go further into hip hop, I want to back up a little. And could you tell us about your memories about gang activity in your neighborhood growing up? About your earliest memories? Uh, let me see. Uh, Royal Javelins, uh, Dirty Dozen, Cypress Crows, The Charmins. The Chinglings, uh, Savage Nomads, the Black Falcons, Savage Skulls, which was in my neighborhood. Uh, yeah, there were like local gangs, like local around the way gangs, mm -hmm. and you know, early mid seventies, seventy four. 75 uh, yeah really rough like depending you know not to either be a part like yeah cool what's up hi because they wasn't really bothering unless it was just war between gangs you know it wasn't like they were picking on people in the neighborhood. If anything, they protect the neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know? And if you had a problem, be like, yo, I got a problem with this guy, and they'll come and, you know, help you out in whatever situation, you know? I got a question, but uh, the reason why I think uh, Brim took the question and said, well, what are you right? Right. Because it was a point in time where some of them gangs was hanging out, like, on the Hunts Point train station. Stuff like that, and then right. be like, "Yo, what you write?" Right. And you say you write something, you getting jumped. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was. Yeah, of course. Yeah, because all up and down the six from the Hunt Thirty Eight, Cypress Brook, uh, all the way to Zariga. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah, it was. I mean, if you was uh, if you was going over people, people would be looking for you. <laughs> so I wasn't good at going over people unless they went over me. But I, w I didn't want to be known that way. Nah, so nah. I try not to go there with, you know, other artists, you know, because, yeah. but because I was a part of the crew, I still had to be careful because even though I was writing the crew, yeah, they knew that I knew him or I knew them. And if I didn't tell, then that's a problem. So that was a big issue, which, you know, it, yeah. it was, a, yeah, we had a, a few uh, a few ins and outs, you know, but uh, yeah, mm -hmm. that's when it was really getting like really tight, mm -hmm. you know. It was a lot of war going on, <laughs> so you have to be careful. Misunderstandings, yes, disagreements. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, thank you for that. Now switching up to your DJ, when did that begin? Oh, Give us some stories well, about yeah. your DJing in the day. Ooh. Yeah. Um, my brother was a DJ since I was about five, six years old. So from there on, it was always records, equipment, records, equipment in my room, which we couldn't even fit. So, uh, I decided it 
Well, you know, you know, Flash was like my mentor. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So, who didn't want to be like Flash? Flash was like the big talk of the town. You know, you know, like yeah, yo, good, 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 good. And it's like he was fast. I was like, yeah, I want to be like him. So you know, my brother's not home, and he's out to work, and I got the equipment up in front of my face. Calling my boy is like, hey, you know, he's not gonna be home today. Come over, let's make a tape. So, you know, come over, let's put it on record and good, 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 good. You know, as best and fast as clean as you can. You know, GLI, 1200s, before the 1200s, we had the SLB ones. So then before that, you know, but um, it was, uh, it was just a, having a, a moment of time that you just wanted to be a part of making something out of nothing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my brother didn't allow me to be on his turntables because he wasn't about mixing and cutting. He wasn't about cutting, he was about mixing. So he was like, don't mess up my turntables, because I don't want that on my turntables. I don't want that, he's not into the hip hop, so he's like, I don't want that crap mm -hmm. you doing on my turntables. I paid a lot, I paid money for my stuff, you would break it, you ain't gonna give me the money. So that's how that happened, but um, yeah, I was, I could have been, Long time ago, on the mm -hmm. radio, I could have been the four Russell Simmons, you know, it could have been anybody in the industry, but you know, because I cut my career short, I was involved with, you know, different arts, plus the girls in my life, so <laughs> that cut my time off too, so, you know, but yeah. Give us the backstory on Amazing Entertainment. What's yeah, that about? that's what I want to hear. Um, Amazing Entertainment is a person that nobody knows who he is. It's basically like Spider-Man. Okay. <laughs> Undercover. Until they find out. You know, like, I'm an artist. So, I don't know, I'm an artist in different ways. I'm a dancer. Dance Spanish, I dance English. People might see me in a the club, they might see me dancing. They're like, I didn't know you dance Spanish. There's the I don't know thing. You know? And then there's people that knew I was a writer, but they didn't know I would dance. They didn't know I was a B boy. Right. They're like, yo, I didn't know you was a B boy. Yo, I thought you was a writer, but I didn't know you was an MC. I, you, and you, yeah, you rhyme too. And, and you, I say, oh, yeah, so it's confusing. You know, so that's what amazing entertainment is about. It's just, it's just trying to figure out. I'm trying to figure out who I am, right? Because <laughs> you know, like I just could have been an artist, a graffiti artist, but I didn't want to be that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be. I wanted to do. I wanted to be. I wanted always to be uh, competitive to everybody that was competitive in the. Okay, Mage, tell us, how do you feel about the hip-hop culture, graffiti culture, and breakdancing going worldwide? How does that make you feel? Um, uh, I'm going to first start by saying, I'm, I always say this, and I'll say it, I still want to say it, I'm going to always say it, but um, the culture that we invented here in the Bronx just made for us. It wasn't made for nobody else. This was just made for us because we needed a way to come together and try to live a peaceful life. And this was our way of, you know, happiness. 
mm -hmm. because there was so much going on. So I feel that the culture was not supposed to go no further than where where is that in the Bronx at the time. But um, it leaked, people leaked it. Mm -hmm. And they kind of like gave it away to other countries and states because there's too many of us here in one bowl and everybody was looking for a way to make money. So they figure they go over here where nobody knows anything and they could, you know, be the inventor over there. But it was too much competition here. So that's that's how it happened. Okay, how do you feel about the money that's being made and the people that get this money? How does that make you feel? Well, the people that the money being made, I mean, there's something we can't stop. You know, it's like somebody somebody decided to say, well, this is a business. Well, we didn't have it as a business. We had it as a fun culture. This was a, this was like a sport to us. Mm -hmm. We didn't have, we didn't have the rich guy who had a lot of money to say, hey, let's turn this into a, a money issue. You know, we had to try to find a way to make money off of this. You know, so because we were poor and we didn't know no better, we didn't know that it was gonna go. How far is that now? Other people have different vision. They're like, hey, what you doing is worth money. Money. You know, we didn't know that. You know, so. Okay, give me give me your thoughts on um, teaching hip hop culture to, to people out 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 in the broad. What are your thoughts on that? Um, teaching is cool. It's all right. I just think that. Teaching the people that's going to take away from us and not give, it's unfair. Right. Because us that have been in this culture from day one, mm -hmm. I feel a certain type of way. Like, I, I, can't, I can't just give it away to somebody who doesn't respect the person that's been doing this as a founder, you know, mm -hmm. and you're going to write a book about it or you're going to make a movie about it and all the cash is for you. And once again, it's just how we be not knowing better, we giving it away. And I've been saying this for the longest we're ready to stop. We need to stop giving this away because this is our culture. And if we let it go, we ain't gonna have it anymore. So that's basically what's going on right now in the world. It's, it don't belong to us anymore. It's like, we I mean, we're, we're the founders, but nobody really cares because everybody that moved on to a different level. It's like we're not we're not important anymore because they got it's it's out there. Yeah. So how can we make something out of it when it's already been stolen? We've been robbed. Yeah. But I think one way we got tricked in the beginning, a lot of us took the fame without the fortune. We was happy to be on TV. Yes. Happy to be in the movies. Meanwhile, they backstage count right. millions. Right. We, we got tricked pretty right. much. We didn't know how worthy. We didn't know how worthy. Right. right. Can you talk to us about Hip Hop Boulevard? What's their mission? And how did you get involved with them? Uh, 
I was I posted up um, something about how these companies uh, got this guy on the train posted with some Adidas sneakers and not trying to be hip hop but not hip hop sort of. So I was like, yo, these companies they give they they run into wrong messages, like they. They putting out their hip hop when they don't know what hip hop is. You know what I mean? Yeah. A guy with curly blonde hair or whatever, and some roller skates with some socks. And we are hip hop, you know, right. or whatever the case is. You know, is mm-hmm. it? It's so much of that going on, you know. And when you point it out. It's like, this don't make no sense. Like, how you are teaching hip-hop when you just decided that you want to teach hip-hop because you got two or three moves and you know how to do a backspin when you want to teach hip-hop. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You have no knowledge. You're not qualified to teach. But somewhere in Alabama or Louisiana, wherever it is, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? But... People don't know no better, so whatever you say is okay because you know, oh, I know this guy, so yeah, okay, cool, so you connected to hip hop. So, you know, it's just, yeah, it, it, when I see it, it's like that's that's just wrong, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's wrong, you know. I don't agree with it, but there's nothing I could do about it, you know what I mean? But, I mean. To me, it hurts because I'm dedicated to my culture. And, you, know. you spoke earlier about, you know, being into style and the gear and the chic things. Where'd you get your people with gear? Mostly for the South Bronx, all the time. Right on Juman. Right on Juman. Right. Yep. Juman number one and Juman number two. Abe's on Jenny's. Or, or, or Abe's on Jenny's, or Leo's. But yeah, yeah, um, Jew Man was a place to go. Jew Man was a spot. Like, he was the hip, you know? Hey, wherever you want to get your Lees or your corduroys, your pre washers, your plaids, you know, mm-hmm. shark skins, sheep skins, quarter fills. Uh, Snow coats, you know, DVDs. I could go on, but yeah, you know, but um, that was where the fashion he bring the fashion to the Bronx. Like, even if you didn't get if you if you got your clothes from somewhere else, it's all right. But if you got them from Jew man, you was qualified. Like. Officially, like Fisher, right? like Major League Baseball, like you only go to Major League Baseball mm-hmm. to get your Major League, but he was major hip hop. Jew man was the spot. Like that's, you get a deal, good price, and you're good, you know. But most of the time, yeah, you know, if you didn't go to Jew man, maybe other people went to Harlem, whatever. Yeah, your spots, you know, to get whatever your shoes or your clothing, you know, depending on what you was getting, you know. Or AJ Lester's on 125th, you get your British Walkers, your Valleys, your, you know, everybody had their spots, you know, Floor Shine. So, the British Walkers. <laughs> yeah. A lot of writers now are producing their own gear and selling it, you know. And, and I noticed in some of the gear that you have, you know, uh, I saw one shirt that says, and you use your tag right. in it. You know, sometimes I amaze myself. I, right. I love it. Okay. You know, tell us about your the gear that you put out. How's that going? You know, and your fashion, you know, uh, yeah. interest. Yeah, because I like, I've always been into fashion. I always thought I could make my own clothes and stuff like that because I got a vision, you know, and I see the streets and I see what's going on. You know, I know how to use uh, needle and sewing and 
machine and stuff like that. But, you know, it's, it's all a piece of art, you know. Um, yeah, so... It's just... Uh, I lost a question, actually. But what was the question? About uh, the gear that you produce. Are you oh, producing okay. any gear? How's that going? Right, okay. Any logos that you use? Right, okay, so... Yeah, this is actually my brand right here that I put together. Uh, I always wanted to do something with a star. Um, I always feel like, you know, I've always been like a, a, a I was, I've always been a mentor in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So, some sort of like a Spider Man, a Superman, whatever, everybody, yo, you know, because I was popular. I was popular. I was always popular for, you know, good reasons or whatever. So people wanted to know, or they heard my name, or they're like, yo, who's this dude, and da da da, and yo, this guy, you know him, or yo, he dances, he raps, he DJs, he, you know, he does so many different things, like, he's a graph writer. So, to me, I was like, mentoring the kids, you know, mm -hmm. always, they look up to me, so I, Yo, come on, let's go practice over there, dancing, mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, yo, teach me this. Yo, can you teach me that? Yo, uh, tell, tell me some stories. Or, you know, it's always it's always been like that. So I, I live my life like that. And I always try to mentor the kids and, you know, tell them, you know, go the right way, make the right decisions and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so my logo resembles me as a star. And I love music. Uh, my name is Maze. Uh, people that know me know that I dance in a circle, and I'm always the star of the circle. So either I'm either I'm dancing or I'm rhyming, I'm singing or I'm playing music or whatever the case is, but it's always music related. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I don't know. I put the name Maze together with Amazing Entertainment, and this is this is what it is right now. And the logo is mine, and I made up the logo, and it has an M A Z in it, M A Z E in it, and um, yeah. So yeah, it's the M, the A, the Z, and the E. Can we get a good look at it? Yeah. Just for the camera. Okay. Oh, here we go. Maze. Now, one thing we haven't talked about is your breaking. You know, were you down with any breaking crews? And tell us about your most memorable battles. Oh, man. Um, I had a few battles in uh, Hunts Point Palace. Most of my battles was <laughs> great as Devil's Nest. Tremont Avenue, the fever, they want to call it the fever. It's, 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 uh, yeah, I had some great battles with great dancers. And um, it was just competing, you know, it's like rocking the floor. And you get tough, I'm going to get tough. We're going to start off cool. I don't want a battle, but if you come to me with a battle and you throw me a, you know, in the wreck, mm -hmm. I'm coming back. So you up rock too? Yeah, I was doing it all. I, I, I Mike can still up rock, but not like before. But, but um, yeah, I, my knees is not too great like before. But yeah, I can still do it. I definitely can still do it. Yeah, I have no, I have no issues. If they turn my button on, I'm going full speed. But yeah, when it comes to like, uh, I guess when the music hits me and I'm turned on, I'm full speed. There's no stopping me. I don't care about what hurts or my back or whatever. Or oh, I was my age at the time. I'm just, I'm just gonna go all out. So yeah, I'm gonna do my best, and we gonna somebody gonna talk about us at the end of the day. Right. So yeah, battles has been many battles. I, I battled. Many circles with many people, popular, you know, and you know that's how you get your that's how you get your reputation, you know, just as everything else like graph and DJing and 
rapping, anything you do is always a battle. Yeah. You have to put your position in if you want to win. So uh, everybody knows me, and they know what I've done. Well, not everybody, but the ones who know me knows, know what I have done. And that's, that's why I could walk the streets in a safe. I don't have no problem with nobody. People are like, yo, you okay? Yo, they know what I've done. Like, I have done nothing wrong. Everything I've done has been right. Mm -hmm. So, wherever I go, people know my face. And they, may, oh, they will always ask me if I'm okay. You got any problems? You good? I'm all right, bro. Thank you. You know, cool. So, you know, that, you know, that's that's great, you know, that I can walk the neighborhood and have no issues with anybody, you know. Battles, I would just dance battles, but, you know, it doesn't go on that route. Part of any breaking crews? Um, not really, no. Nah. I made my own crew called Mistake of Breakers. <laughs> Mistake of Breakers? Mistake of Breakers. All right. <laughs> so, yeah, that was like a little fun little thing we had, but. <laughs> But yeah, but I, you know, like I said, I wasn't into crews too much, but um, I was basically a soloist. I always want to represent myself, like, but I rolled, I, I rolled with people that wanted me to roll with them, mm -hmm. but I wasn't into that battle scene, like, yo, let's go to Roseland, yo, we're going to have a battle this weekend, and da -da -da. I said, yeah, but I... These guys are over there from Brooklyn, and they have the Bronx, and now it becomes a issue, and they there every weekend, and I'm like, nah, I'm not battling. I'm not, I'm not into that battle stuff. I get it one or two times, but I'm not into you putting your hands in my face and you making me look bad, and nah, I'm not into that. You, you, that's that's a different. You stay on your level, I stay on my level, and we could, you know, we could battle, but don't come close to me and don't touch me. But now you're looking at a different, something you know, different. Something different. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So that's why I stood out of battles. You know, it was like, nah, we battled to a certain point. Yeah. So that's how that that is. Yeah. That's how it was. Now the word graffiti. What does that word mean to you? Destruction. <laughs> destruction. Painting destruction. That's what it means to me. Putting up your name and letting people see that you know you're you're an upcoming writer. Or you're, you're getting up. Graffiti is about getting up. I I would think graffiti. Am I correct? Or I, I don't know. Is that correct? Is a, it's a lot a, of different terms. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. A lot like, of different. Ones. It, it could it could mean a few things. Graffiti is just depending on how you look at it because. Right. They got graffiti people that just do it for uh, commercialize. Or you got people that destroy. You got people that just like to paint beautiful colors. So it's everybody. It's, it's a whole lot of different things. But I would say it's about getting up. You know, it's about getting up. You know, graffiti could be positive. It could be negative. I don't know. You know who how you want to use it. So, you know, it could be gang related or it could be just socializing. Mm -hmm. You know, it got its good and it, it got its good and it's got its bad. True. How has your understanding of writing changed over time? How has the culture changed from the time when you first started writing to today? Um Well, when I was doing it I got got it from guys like him. Who's that? You know, and this is like, if it wasn't for him, uh, I came from them. You know, and I, for me, for me, graffiti is, graffiti is the trains. Because I don't see myself going a wall to wall, neighborhood to neighborhood, and writing because that's not, you know, that's not my thing of writing. You know, maybe for others, that's what they want to do. They want to destroy New York, whatever. I liked it on the train, which was much better. It was more fun, uh, more exciting. My, my name will run. I didn't have to run my name. You know what I mean? 
Like, I don't have to go to every borough and put up my name. My name was running on the trains from borough to borough. So, you know, it's a different feeling. It's the train feeling. The kids would never know what that was. Only we would know, you know, because we were there. So they have a different, they have a different view now. They doing, you know, bombing people's houses. That which it looks ugly, you know, it looks ugly. You got a brand new house and somebody coming right out the wall. You know, I don't think that's 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 not cool. You know, you don't get points for that. Yeah, on on the door, you don't you, know, you don't get no points for that. That's not points for that. Yeah. Before I ask the last question, book, do you have any uh, other questions you'd like to ask? No, I, I'd like to add on. Or just you're right about that. They'll never know the feeling with the trains and yards and racking up right. and all of that. Now they walk into a store with a platinum card and buy all this oh, thing. Okay. Yeah. I'm not buying. It. Right, exactly. We would never, yeah, yeah. You was considered a toy. But some of the art is nice. It, it's now it's a fusion of functions: fine art, street art, grab, right. music. They go into galleries, right? So it's evolving. Right. My my thing is, I would always be a writer. The gallery thing now is the thing to do. Whatever is the following, whatever. Of course, I want to sell my painting for a billion dollars. <laughs> Who wouldn't? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, why not? I would love to. Who's the person going to buy it? That's what I want. Right. I would love to see that person. You know, I, would, I want somebody to buy my painting for me, so I don't have to, you know, struggle so hard. You know what I mean? But well, don't wait till I die to buy it. Exactly <laughs> right. You know what I mean? But um, you know, this is something that I we have. I got forty-five years. Yeah. The culture, the culture for 45 to 50 years of this culture. Mm -hmm. And something got to give, <laughs> you know, so you know, mm -hmm. that's it. I, I ain't giving, I ain't giving up. I ain't, whether it's, whatever it is, I ain't giving up. You're right. going gonna to see me if, if, if you're out there and there's something happening, you, you're going to see me out there like, oh, okay, I'll see you involved. Yeah, I'm involved. Yeah. Is without the culture, I'm not. I'm not. It's not me. You know what I mean. I I, I have to have. I have to be involved on a daily basis. You know. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything you want to add? Anything we missed? Did Enjoy. you ask me about the hip hop boulevard? I did. You know, uh, you want to go digging a little more okay, about there are, what you guys are doing, activities, well, what you guys are about? Okay, yeah, I, I, I ran off that. But, um, yeah, Hip Hop Boulevard, um, well, okay, I was talking about how they were using marketing the wrong way. So Al Pizarro hit me up on that. He says, yo, I feel you on that. I need you to get on with me on board. And I want you to be a part of this Hip Hop Boulevard thing. So, uh, you know, we got together, we started making a couple of moves, and they said, you know, I want you to, you know, be down with this project. And I said, okay, cool, I got no problem. I'll help you, we'll help each other, we'll just try to get this together. And, um, on, you know, we're just promoting and picking up members and I'm introducing and bringing members in and this guy, that guy, DJ, rapper, MC, whatever, you know, graffiti artist, you know, I was like kind of like the plug for a second, you know, so I kind of like try to, you know, help out with the Making a boulevard, uh, the medium, you know, and um, from there on, it's just been growing and growing. So now, you know, we had like no less than fifty members. Mm -hmm. Now I don't know. Hip Hop Boulevard has about who knows, maybe three thousand, four thousand wow. members. So now it's going around worldwide and 
people are paying attention and grabbing on. So, you know, I'm proud for Apple Zara when he's doing his thing. Um, and um, I'm just networking, you know. So, yeah. How'd you meet Al Pizarro? Uh, Al Pizarro goes back to the 70s. Uh, my brother, like I said, was a DJ, so we all we used to talk DJ stuff. We talk about record pools and uh, clubs and who was who and what DJs had had props. And Al Pizarro, I used to go to clubs in La Mirage when he played in La Mirage. And, you know, he was in the record pool, my brother in the record pool, so... I was I was mixing the whole culture like mining other businesses like you know just you know, listening going and you know I would see Red Alert I would see Bad Bada I would see Jazzy J when they were just DJs like when they were not even producers or radio or nothing right like, you know when they were just DJs they come into the record pool. One of the first record pools that ever existed was Sure Records, Sure Shot Records, on what uh, St. Lawrence, Westchester. So, rest in peace to Bobby Davis, which he was the head guy. Um, so I would see these guys just come in there and just come hang out and get their records. I'm in there like 10 o'clock, 10.30 at night, and I'm looking at the studio like, yeah, I want to do music. That's my purpose of being in there, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, I want to write some songs. I want to do some music. But uh, I would see these DJs come in there, like, oh, okay, cool. And I had to be, like, real cool about it. Like, not not trying to be, like, a fan, but knowing who, oh, yeah, yo, four months of flex. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, you probably don't know me, but I've been DJing way, way before you. You know what I'm saying? I was DJing in 76, 77. You just started DJing 78, 9, 10, right. whatever, 1980, whatever. So, but, um, yeah, you know, but I, I've i gotten a lot of education on music. So, you know, I've been, I've been through, you know, Louis Vega, Todd Terry. I learned all this from for being around my brother and mm -hmm. my brother's my partner and my circle. So, you know, it's, it's just it's just Bronx. It's just Bronx actions. Right. Like if you was if you was an artist and you was into the culture like that, then you you just involve yourself with everything. Like you don't exclude yourself from nothing. Because you know it's all a part of the same it's in the same circle. Disco, hip hop. It's all it's all the same. It's all the same thing. It's just mm -hmm. you know. But um, yeah, we all come from that era. You know, they, you know, you're an artist. You're interested in being an artist. You got to do your homework. So sure. I was doing my homework in every different angle. Mm -hmm. You know. Hip Hop Boulevard just had an event less than a month ago. Yeah. Uh, right over here in Williamsbridge Oval Park, you had a lot of old graffiti artists. You had canvases up. That was a great event. What's What's the next big event coming up for Hip Hop Boulevard? Anything on the horizon? Um, right now, I'm not sure. I think there's like uh, radio activities and stuff like that. Um, I think the Jazzy J Festival maybe but could be coming up again. Okay. So that's something that I probably will be looking out for. But um, yeah, the I mean every year gets bigger and bigger. So we'll see what happens this year. You know, you you touched on music and we really didn't hit on a lot of your music production and, and things that you've been involved with. Let us talk to us about any music productions you've been into. You know, uh, that you want to share with. I'm just, I just write, I just write and I put music together like I'm, I'm an artist, you know, so uh, I could write a song tomorrow and put a beat on it and 
practice it at home or try to put it down and record and stuff like that, you know, and I just, it's just, it's just the art in me, you mm -hmm. know, like, like, it's not hard, like, for me, it's not hard, like, I can put, I could put something together in less than three hours, if I really, you know, and it could sound fair, you know, you know, take a song, make a song from scratch or sample a song, sample a track, sample two, three tracks, put them together, write a song, get the hook, you know, so, you know, I, I've done, I've done a couple of projects, you know, might be a little old, but I've done a few projects and I don't, you know, I never try to put them out or not like that, but I've, I've heard from people that say, yeah, yo, you should have put them out or you should put them out, but, you know, I just, like, I'm not, I'm not in it because I want to be a superstar, but I'm in it because I love it. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter to me. As long as I got it recorded to myself, and my, I leave it for my kids or whoever, and they could, they might have something to hold on to. A legacy. You know what I mean? So, but um, I think I'm good enough to be out there. It's like everybody else. I, I'm, I just don't. I, I haven't pushed it as far as I can. You know what I mean? I don't, you know, I just do it just because it's a hobby. You know what I mean? Right, right. And we like to end all our oral histories with the same question. What does the Bronx mean to you? The Bronx to me is the whole world. In a hungry bubble. And before we let any of the artists leave us, you were, you were already in our black book that, okay. that Olga gave yeah, us, but we still there. would like to ask you to write your tag so that we can put in our archives, right. you know? And uh, yeah, Butch is going to hand you the book and some colors. You know, I think they are already empty here. Yeah, I got to give them a bloody face. Yeah, this is for you. All right, let's get to it. Yeah, let's put <laughs> some color in it. Oh, boy. All right. Ah, I'm going to do this. All right. I guess I'll do a throw up. Huh? Yeah, yeah let's just give us something. You yeah. got your tag. Everybody develops their signature tag, huh? Yeah, wow. Woo! All right, I love see it. it. Love it. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, should I fill it in? Uh, okay, I'll put it in. Uh, It's fun. <laughs> uh, you know what that just made me think of? A poster board is paint pens. <laughs> a nice black outline or something. Okay. 3D or whatever. Oh, boy. This is fun. That was a good one. That was a good one. <laughs> oh, that explains it. Uh, she put the lock I, on. No, I left it in my car. She put the lock on. How did, how did I get it? Yeah, the 
six line. Back in the days. Does that throw up on an old six train? Uh, yeah. I wish I had a picture of it. <laughs> Somebody might. Why you writing? I know I've heard different things. Tat, T A T. Tell us what what that is to you. What that acronym is. Uh, it's a team. It's um, it's a baseball team, like you know, Yankees, Red Sox. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> but the word tat, T A T. What does that mean? Uh, top artistic talents. God, okay. Or top, tough. tough Artistic teenagers, uh, trash all toys, uh, tough ass teenagers, yeah, yeah, the A team, yeah. Can we look at the throw up? Yeah, why not? Right. And it goes on and on. Maze. Nice. Mays, I want to thank you. This thank was you. an incredible interview. Thank I you. I appreciate it. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. So I appreciate you.